Good morning, everybody. So back in 2016, uh, the Iraq Bird Strike Working Group was set up uh, at the initiative of the FAA to provide um, advice on how to improve uh, safety related to bird strike on rotorcraft. So this presentation is a follow-up of last year's presentation, and we would like to share with you uh, the final outcome of the working group and to inform you on what we intend to do um, as awareness authorities with this report. So this presentation is actually based on a presentation that was originally provided by Michael Smith that, uh, of Bell Helicopter, who is the chairman of the group, and we would like to thank Michael for his help. So just before the symposium last year, um, a, a Bell 407 was actually uh, impacted with uh, three pound birds while he was flying uh, at 19 knots, and the accurate windshield was actually failed. Uh, more recently, two weeks ago about, uh, Abel um, was also, um, from the UK actually, was also damaged due to a bird's uh, impact and the co-pilot was injured. So those events are reminding that although bird's impact is not a major cause of accident, it is a, a growing concern and um, we have many incidents and more and more incidents um, and damage due to bird strike. So, Based on those observations, the FAA has initiated the Iraq Working Group with members of the aviation community, uh, so manufacturers, major manufacturers in Europe and in the US, uh, operators, and um, there was also the FAA and EASA as a non-voting member, but a resident authority. Gary Groch was actually participating to the working group uh, before his retirement, and Martin Kreis is taken, taking over this activity, and I represented EASA. I want to mention that Corey Cummings from Air Method was also uh, sharing the group with uh, Michael Smith. So I would like to remind what was the content of the tasks. Um, Basically, uh, we had to provide recommendation on birth right protection for part 27 and 29 for new type certificate aircraft, for newly manufactured aircraft, and for existing fleets. So um, for part 27, uh, the question was if we can, could define a new birth right protection requirement, because today there is none. For part 29, there is an existing, existing requirement since 1996, but um, the question was, is it adequate? Because this requirement is about uh, um, ensuring continuous safe flight and landing after a bird impact of one kilo um, at, considered at VNE &E or VH, whichever is lesser. So for newly manufactured rotorcraft, um, about 27 and 29 non-certified according to this requirement, we had actually to provide protection and make them effective in a retroactive manner. For the existing fleet, the task was about incorporating rotorcraft birth right protection improvement and standards. So we had to consider non-traditional birth strike protection means. The report had to provide policy and recommendation and guidances, and all actions had to be supported by a cost-benefit analysis. So at the end, the report was delivered last year um, and the Iraq actually had the, the, the duty to support FAA uh, uh, in the question that might arise for, from this report. So the group was set up in July 2016, and 17 months later, um, a report was provided two months after the target date, but at the end, the Iraq actually approved the report. I will remind some uh, results uh, of this report that were also presented last year. Based on the U.S. data, it was observed that most of the rotorcraft flying in the U.S. are actually non-compliant. And a vast majority of the rotorcraft flying in the U.S. are part 27 that were initially not requested to be compliant. So about 2% of the U.S. fleet is actually compliant, which represents 200 rotorcraft, about uh, out of 10,000, so it's not a lot. So the efficiency of this requirement of 20 years after was very limited. Um, other important result is that 
the forward section of the main, uh, of the main uh, uh, let's say, the part, the section of the rotocraft forward of the main rotor mast is the most impacted. I think that you know that. Um, the windshield is the one, uh, the large surface uh, uh, that is most impacted and before the main rotor. And this is actually valid for part 27 and part 29. The rear uh, tail rotor and empennage are actually not so much in, uh, concerned by bird impact in, by experience. And I hand the microphone to Michael, to, excuse me, to Martin. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Idris. Um, yeah, the, the, and the, the, they came out of this, uh, the ARAC, and basically, you know, it was interesting, the number of uh, bird strikes on the windshield being the most critical component, or at least the, where they saw the most risk. Um, in the non-compliant 27 and non-compliant 29, a large percentage of uh, windshield burn strikes um, resulted in damage to the aircraft, but for the, the uh, 38 bird strikes that occurred for compliant designs that actually met the rule, none of those had uh, structural damage. So uh, that's really st statistically significant. You know, the, the rule works is really what that says. Um, now, this is what was originally proposed. Uh, they, the, work, the working group um, did a tiered approach, uh, you know, risk safety you know, on a tiered approach. Um, and they had done it on the number of occupants, and then it, they've recently put a Rev A of the report out. I believe the ARAC is going to consider that at their next meeting and forward it to the FAA. But, you know, it's based on the number of passengers um, and to just make it align with, with the rules better. But what I would say on this is, you know, like, like Clement uh, presented earlier in proportionality, um, the safety continuum both that EASA is proposing and what the FAA already has in policy doesn't necessarily align with the same tiering approach of the working group. Um, there's some logic and desire on, on both, you know, I think us and EASA to align both, you know, bird strike, if we're going to have a safety continuum that aligns with the 1309, you know, continuum. So if, if that can be done, we will attempt to do that. Um, if it does not make sense and, it, and, and we end up agreeing that, with the working group that there's a different tiered approach, um, you know, it's, it's possible we could do that. Uh, through, um, in the working group, so one of the major assumptions they made on windshield penetration when they were trying to do their cost analysis was um, to, they, they sort of did it risk-based and said 11% of the 11% of the windshield area is would incapacitate a pilot. It, it, it hit him in the head, and 25% of the frontal area would would uh, partially incapacitate the pilot and could you know lead to you know uh, you know damage you know further uh, you know vulnerabilities and you know injuries. Um, so. They use that statistical method in their uh, cost analysis. Um, the FAA and EASA, you know, will consider using that approach as well in rulemaking uh, when we do our cost-benefit analysis. Um, this table actually just comes out of the report that they generated with a summary of all the recommendations. What uh, we've marked in red here is really the area where the working group has recommended, uh, you know, the safety procedures as opposed to actually requiring um, you know, uh, bird, t you know, the uh, demonstrations of compliance and the capability to take the bird. Um, and I'll, I'll get into a second to what some of those safety procedures are. Um, but the conclusion in their report, uh, there was uh, dissenting positions from the conservative approach that they used in the cost uh, analysis um, for the windshield. But in general, everyone on the committee, uh, all the, you know, the manufacturers and operators uh, generally supported the adoption of the uh, safety standards and uh, safety procedures um, coming out of, out of the report. The ARAC uh, executive level committee accepted that report when, when, when presented last year and uh, forwarded it to the FAA. And uh, this is one of the pieces we'll use in our evaluation when we get into the, the real rulemaking part. Um, so now, what, what exactly is the FAA doing moving forward? I'd say we're, we're still reviewing this report. We received it about a year ago. Um, it's, you know, it's, 
very detailed, well done report from industry. Um, that's one of the pieces of information we're going to use in the rulemaking process. Uh, you know, it's it's very good to understand, you know, from the experts in the industry what their what their understanding of the problem is, what how industry thinks is is an appropriate uh, way to move forward. Um, we'll, but FAA will continue, you know, studying and doing you know, further evaluation and cost benefit analysis as we get into the rulemaking process. Um, outreach and policy is really a way to, to have some immediate impact because rulemaking is a multi-year process. We do hope to start, you know, or to promote this in, you know, fiscal year 2020 uh, rulemaking. Um, but it is a multi-year process and we have every intention to harmonize and coordinate as much as possible with the ASA, um, whether, you know, they move forward first, we move forward first in rulemaking, or we do it uh, jointly. Uh, the intent is definitely to, to, to be on the same page. Um, as far as outreach, you know, the, the pilots are really the first line of defense. You know, the working group talked a lot about, you know, the pilot making reasonable flight decisions or operators making reasonable flight decisions uh, can greatly reduce the risk of bird strikes. You know, flying less than 80 knots, um, personal protective equipment, wearing helmets, there's a, there's a pilot um, I've spoken to quite a bit who was on the working group. I, I wasn't on the working group, but I, he said one of the biggest changes this working group did for him is that he always wears a helmet with the visor down when he flies and anybody else that's in the, is, that's in the cockpit with him uh, flies the same way. So he's made these changes in, in really implementing within his company. Um, but, you know, landing lights, pulse lights, or other ideas. Uh, the, the working group report uh, is, a, is a very good read. Um, anybody can email me. I can forward you the link. It's available on the FAA website. It is public. Um, you know, we, we will consider, you know, infos or SAIBs to get the message out and, and work with, you know, HAI and other, you know, industry groups to try to, you know, propose, you know, pilots, you know, or I should say OEMs and operators, you know, to include, you know, flight manual procedures, not really limitations, but, you know, there, there's a lot of best practices. You know, if you're flying in bird-rich environments, as you know, Michael would say, you know, make, make good decisions and, you know, you can, you can prevent this from occurring. Um, you know, he referred to it as a digging for taters. For me, I just, you know, I'd rather call it, uh, you know, best practices. Um, we're, we're also going to continue, you know, discussion with industry and industry groups. Uh, and, you know, ACs are really, you know, the RAC, there were some recommendations to update the AC. So um, we have every intention of doing that through the, through the next rounds of uh, AC changes. Um, and possible rulemaking? Similar to yesterday's discussion, we, we can use 27.2 and 29.2 for future manufacturing um, of old type designs. Um, operating rules, if we thought it was appropriate, you know, as, as a way to you know, required in certain operating environments could be a possibility. Part 26 could be a possibility. <laughs> the, what I didn't put on here is there are also recommendations for uh, addition of uh, uh, an actual Part 27 rule for future type designs. Um, that would just be a straightforward addition of a 27.631 rule um, for certain Part 27 aircraft. But once again, we've not made any decisions to date. Um, hopefully we'll be in this rulemaking process in, in the coming year, year and a half. And uh, now I'll hand it back and let her address. So what are we going to do on the other side? So today um, we want actually to improve the aerosness standards, but um, when we went to the IRA group, we didn't want to go with empty, with empty pockets, uh, and we looked at what we had in, at EASA in terms of database, um, and we have a set of data from 26, 2006 to 2016 that was showing that at the end, potentially in Europe, we have more uh, rotorcraft that are certified to burst strike. Um, but it doesn't change the, the, the conclusion. We still need more protection. So birth strike is not a, a major cause of fatality in Europe because we have no accident so far, no fatal accident so far, but it's a growing safety and economic issue. And we have many um, 
um, injuries, major to uh, minor to major injury caused by, by uh, windshield penetration after impact with a bird. And in 30 to 34 percent of the case, um, the the windshield failed after impact. So the impact areas are very similar to what was presented in the Iraq report. So basically, we can consider that this Iraq is also report is also valid for um, to represent the situation in Europe. So. Beginning of this year, we've started to uh, build a project a preliminary impact assessment to support um, new actions to put in the European Plan for Aviation Safety, submit to the necessary authorities for, to, in order for them to decide what would be the priority. Seven topics has been identified initially as being safety issues uh, based on the last 10, 15 years of um, data in terms of accident incidents. And out of this uh, scrutiny, um, the birth strike protection topics was part of the short list of five items. And we have decided that it will be one of the subjects to be developed in the rulemaking process in the next five years. So it comes, of course, after the occupant protection uh, topic, which has a priority. Um, so our recommendations and uh, rulemaking decisions will be based on the Iraq report, but we have in-house development on methods also to evaluate safety risks. So we will probably combine the two studies, the Iraq one uh, and also EASA studies. So what are we going to do? So in the Rotocraft department, we have the objective of um, um, increasing safety um, and play on several axes, not only on design, but also on operation. Martin presented you some uh, non-traditional means that were suggested by the ARA group. We are going to um, make a safety promotion of those non-traditional means for burst drive protection to operators um, when actually no other mean or method is actually judged uh, economically viable. And those tasks will be submitted to the evaluation of the Rotograph Sectorial Committee. This is for operation. In terms of rulemaking, um, we will certainly offer to develop a, a, a rule for Part 27, so at 27.631, uh, to mandate actually bird strike certified design. Windshield could be a minimum. Um, we first intend to uh, target the equivalent of tier three, the higher category of part 27, but this is actually to be discussed and to be further uh, um, defined and worked out. So we intend also to amend um, part, the equivalent of part 26 in the US, so we call it the CS26, to create some more provision for retroactive application of some uh, bird strike certify, certification uh, uh, um, rules for newly manufactured rotorcraft and also existing fleet. What we are going to do is not fully defined yet, but we have the plan to build something early in next year and share it, try to seek for harmonization with Airworthiness Authority, mainly the FAA, and also Transport Canada and other authorities. So, <clears throat> What we want to do is, is also to increase safety on, on, um, in front of bird impact. Uh, we will not do it in our corner. Probably we will uh, use the proportionality as presented by Clément, and I think we'll be able to share with you more next year. Thank you.